You must be getting married. Why else do you dress like an undertaker on holiday? I'm going to Uncle's house, Papa. He's given me a car. Brakes must be faulty. Looking back at my beautiful laundry, I can see it's about a boy and a father being stuck together too much, which is, I guess, the, my own story, that I was, too, in a sense, too much with my own father. We were very close. And in the film, he has to leave the father. He has to leave the weak father, played by Roshan Seth. He's taken away by another man. It's always the uncle. In, in all stories, it's always the uncle. But that's a very, very, you might say, old-fashioned story of two people, a child and a parent, being locked together in some sense. And luckily, another person comes along, intervenes, takes the child by the hand and leads him out into the world. So that's rather beautiful. I never thought about that before. But that's the story of the film. But he leads him out into a bigger world where there are more voices. There's more going on. And then he becomes sexualized. He becomes sexualized because he meets Daniel Day Lewis. I mean, Daniel Day Lewis would sexualize a chair, you know. And he becomes potent. He starts to run the laundrette. He starts to have sex with Dan. He starts to become a kind of businessman. He finds a new identity. So it's interesting that his sexuality and his business sense and all that stuff is tied up in one bundle, you might say, with his potency. Yeah, that was, that was the idea. That in a sense, your sexuality isn't separate. You know, it's all one thing. Once you, you know, once you find your sexuality, you, you can become a much better writer, as it were. It's all, it's all libido. It's all excitement. It's all energy. What got me out of the suburbs was American culture. I guess what you might call American pop culture, pop stroke literary culture. People like Ralph Salinger. Obviously, Kerouac, Ginsberg, and obviously American movies of that time, Easy Rider and so on, but mostly American pop and rock, and mostly people like Jimi Hendrix and later on the Velvet Underground. And obviously, that connected with Bowie, who went to the same school as I, who's obviously older than me. We were all from South London, really into dressing up. And Bowie kind of invented the idea, certainly in pop, of making a new identity which seemed very liberating to me and to all of us, because we were locked into the suburbs. So you could get out of the suburbs by becoming an artist. So I thought I could invent myself as a writer. Looking back now, it seems like an incredible idea, because there have been really no black and Asian writers who have been born in Britain before. Obviously, there were writers like Naipaul and subsequently Rushdie, but both of whom were, you know, born elsewhere. So the idea of being a punk British Asian writer which I had to invent myself as, now seems incredible. I'd grown up in the 60s in South London with kids who, I guess, resembled skinheads, boys of my age and class who chose that style, you might say. So I was starting to explore all that. I was starting to write about that in various plays. And by the time 1984 turned up, I felt by then that the theatre thing wasn't really working out for me. And I was looking for a new form. And then Walter Donahue, who I had known for a long time from the theatre, came to me and said, will you write a film for Channel 4? So I went to Pakistan for the first time. And uh, I began to write My Beautiful Laundrette there. But I'd also had an uncle, really a family friend, who'd been sent to me because my family was in despair about my career, because although I said I wanted to be a writer, I wasn't really making any money as a writer. And he had laundrettes, and he used to take me around his laundrettes. And he just introduced me to this world, which I really knew nothing about, of the sort of small Pakistani business entrepreneurship, I guess. And there was my brother, you know, standing outside with some woman. <laughs> <laughs> They were completely without clothes. <laughs> there are scenes in My Beautiful Laundrette where all the men sit around, and I'd seen that in Karachi. My uncles, my aunts, their friends, my cousins. There'd be all kinds of people living in the house who you would suddenly open a door and there'd be somebody else living there and so on. And I came from a two-up, two-down culture. You know, two kids, two adults, that was that. So the extended family I really fell in love with because there were so many other people. So I had begun to think about the extended family in my beautiful laundry. The extended family was also a Thatcher idea. Thatcher was always going on about how much she loved the family and so on and so on. But super capitalism smashed the families up um, because there was no work, because of um, people had to move around, because of the vast numbers of immigrants coming. She made a revolution 
at the same time trying to cling to what she called British values. It was, it was a hilarious contradiction. We were still struggling with it. Oh. Oh, whoa. Whoa. Hello, darling. But there was a lot of physical violence and intimidation on the streets in South London at that time. When you went out, people looked at you funny, or they chased you, or you got beaten up, and it was quite physically rough. And there were marches through the 70s and into the 80s by the National Front and the British National Party and so on, you know, in Catford Lewisham, which is where I come from. Big confrontations between racists and the left and other anti-racist groups. So I wanted to expose, of course, the abuses of racism, many of which I'd suffered. But I also wanted to become a writer, obviously, with my own voice. This damn country has done us in. That's why I'm like this. One of the things that was happening around the time of my beautiful laundrette was not only the films of people like Derek Jarman and Peter Greenaway, which were, let's say, looking towards the future, it was this new view of construction of the past. Those were the days in India when we ruled everything. So David Lean made a really boring film of Passage to India. And there were other films like the Merchant Ivory films, which had got a bit dull by then, which again were reviving this idea of Britain's past. So Thatcher really was making a revolution. She was, she was destroying, really destroying the working class, destroying the inst institutions of collectivity, creating a neoliberal Reaganite paradise that we now are lucky enough to live in. But at the same time, there was a turn back to the past. It was, an it, it was an attempt now looking back, you can see, to resurrect or construct an idea of British identity. We were saying, Stephen and I and Tim Bevan and Sarah Radcliffe and the others, we were saying, look, let's forget about all that. There's a new Britain that's emerging, a new relation to identity, and there are these new minorities who are the new workers of the future. Why are you working for these people? Packies. It's work, that's why. I want to do some work for a change instead of all this hanging around. What, you're jealous? No, I'm angry, Johnny. I don't like to see one of our blokes groveling to Packies. Look, they came over here to work for us. That's why we brought them over, OK? By the mid-'80s, people were really aware of the fragmentation of, of British culture, by which I mean that they started to look for the stories of women, the stories of gay people, the, the stories of black and Asian people. And the 80s really was the period for uncovering so-called neglected or dissident voices. And when I met Stephen, I found Stephen to be a very liberating figure for me because he encouraged me to be more vulgar. He encouraged me to walk around going, make it worse, make it more horrible, you know, be more vile, be more rude. So I was really pleased that Stephen directed this film because he didn't do it as a sort of realistic film. He did it quite high, it's quite operatic. You know, the idea of casting Daniel Day-Lewis rather than Gary Oldman was quite a sort of operatic choice because you know, Daniel Day-Lewis is hardly of proletarian stock. And Stephen kept saying, do it like a Western, do it like a Western. And I still don't know what he means by that, but I think he means something like you create tension by people moving towards each other, you know, that eventually, you know, nothing's happening and then something will happen. Well, it'll be closing time soon, you'll be locking a place up and coming to bed. No, it never closes. One of us has got to be there. That way we begin to make money. You're getting greedy. I want big money. I'm not going to be beat down by this country. When we were at school, you and your friends kicked me all round the place. And what are you doing now? Washing my floor. That's how I like it. The other influence, I think, that was, that was sort of structurally important was Paris, Texas, a film which is a masterpiece. And I think we were both really influenced by the mirror stuff, because the mirror in My Beautiful Laundrette is really useful. It separates the two parts of the laundry at the back from the front, but they can communicate through the mirror, they can see each other through the mirror, and you can shoot in three spaces at once. And it, it really helped us, because otherwise the actors would have had, you know, keep walking in and out and around behind the mirror. I'm not really a theatre writer, but I do have a kind of high style. And when my characters speak, I really want them to speak. And the movies that I write, the talking, really matters a lot. You know, what's interesting about life 
for me as a writer is what people say to each other. So you want to see that, and you want to see the way conversation changes people. That's always fascinated me. And obviously, you might say, in the sense, the cinema comes out of the theatre, and the people talking, changing each other by, by by using words, and that's my job. I'm the word man that changes people. So there is, a, it's quite talky that movie, and, and Stephen found a style to integrate quite a lot of the talking. <laughs> I'm finished. Only Omar matters. I'd known Saeed because he'd been in my place before. Roshan Seth I knew because he'd been in David Hare's play, Map of the World. I'm working on it. Is Tanya a possibility? Mm, mm. Tanya? And I knew Rita because she'd been in a play of mine at the Royal Court. And she lived three doors down from me anyway, so she came along. And then she brought Gordon, because she knew Gordon. And Stephen said, do you know anybody else? And so we just brought in people we knew. Those days, when you cast a film with Asian actors, it wasn't like thousands of people would turn up like today. You know, a few people would turn up, and they'd, you know, they'd be working as waiters and taxi drivers and doing this, that, and the other. It, it was impossible to be a minority actor in the, U, in the UK at that time and, and work all the time. You know, they never had black and Asian people on, on, on TV. It was a big thing. You have to remember what a big thing it was that there would be a, a black or an Asian writer and that there would be Asian actors uh, playing leads in, in, in a movie. All this was, was really a novelty, you know. None of those directors, Ken Loach, Peter Greenaway, Neil, et cetera, et cetera, would ever use minority actors. It never occurred to them. It wasn't even in their view, as it were, of what they, what they were doing to think about that. I'm dead impressed by all this. Daniel Day-Lewis had been in Dracula, which had been directed by Stephen's brother, which he, why he had funny hair. I mean, half his hair was white and half his hair was black when he came in. I can't see the connection between Dracula and having odd hair, but there, there it was. So Stephen's brother had recommended him. And Dan really wanted to do it. He was really, really insistent that he do it. And he claimed that he'd been brought up in Greenwich and he knew rough people and he was tough and all that, but he was really a posh boy. His father had been the poet laureate, you know. And Stephen takes chances. Stephen was convinced by Dan. Dan wrote Stephen a letter, I think, threatening to break Stephen's legs. So Dan got the part. And I remember him and Gordon, we used to go out drinking. And he and Gordon used to sort of go off together and sit really close and sort of gossip. And they really worked hard. And Dan would come around my house a lot. And he would watch Scorsese films. He would watch Mean Streets a lot. And he was really looking for something in those early Scorsese films, Robert De Niro, really. But I think who he really loved was Clint. And there's a lot of Clint Clintisms in my beautiful laundry. It's really the stillness that Clint has. You know, that Clint is always looking still, but alert as though he's gonna draw a gun, but he's not doing anything. There's that wonderful scene under the light when, when uh, Gordon gets out of the car and goes across. And Dan standing there like some sort of really attractive rent boy whore, looking really hot and dirty, and just standing there. And that's a very Clint moment, I think. I know who it is. <laughs> How are you? All right? Working? Well, what are you doing now, then? Oh, this kind of thing. It's quite a romantic film, quite a Hollywoody film, in the sense it's about two people falling in love and kissing, and the way Stephen does that. That shot of them kissing, in a sense, is both subversive because they're boys, and, you, and in those days you never saw boys kissing in the cinema, so it's quite subversive. On the other hand, it's kind of a, an old-fashioned two people falling in love kissing movie. Stephen also ordered me to write a happy ending, which I was very happy to do because he wanted a happy Hollywood ending. Stephen had been really encouraging, and by the end of My Beautiful Laundrette, he and I, as we still are, become big mates. And his intelligence and knowledge of politics, actually, and culture had really inspired me. So then I went much further. I read The Buddha of Suburbia, and then I did My Son the Fanatic, a film I'm really proud of. Um, I wrote The Black Album, and I really felt 
the race is the hinge. You open that door and you can really look into the soul of this country. You're looking into the past, colonialism, passes to India, all the retro stuff, but also you're looking into the future, the kind of societies we're going to make in the future. And also with the entrepreneurship, thinking about the nature of capitalism and how capitalism works and what it does to people. So that movie was really, for me, the hinge. It was really, I, I felt, the first time that I'd really found my voice as an artist. You know, it taken me a long time. You know, nobody becomes an artist overnight. No, nobody, you know, not the Beatles, not anybody. It always takes 10 years for you to absorb others' influences and then to begin to figure out who you are. And Stephen really helped me. Seen Johnny? Piss off back to the jungle, one boy.